Thank you for joining us. This is going to be part six of Annihilation or Eternal Suffering. And the reason we're doing this series is to show what some claim the Bible teaches about eternal suffering. And the, uh, the real uh, issue of what the Bible teaches uh, as far as annihilation. And the way we've done this is in the first uh, video that we did, we discussed the uh, a number of verses that uh, proponents of eternal suffering put forth uh, to, to make their case uh, for that particular doctrine. And we also looked at the proper biblical hermeneutic or methodology that God tells his people they need to use whenever they study the Bible. Uh, then in the second video, we began looking at some of these verses and how the proponents of eternal suffering view those verses or actually interpret those verses. And then for the last uh, uh, three studies, three, four, and five, we've been looking at what the Bible actually teaches about the interpretation of those verses. And we're going to continue today with number six. And I would like to start by going back to the Garden of Eden. Uh, this is where sin and death uh, first uh, took place. And I'd like to start uh, with uh, Romans uh, chapter 6, verse 23. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, I made the statement in one of our earlier uh, videos that in this particular verse, we see that God speaks about eternal life. However, when he talks about death, he just says the wages of sin is death. He doesn't say it's eternal death. So that is one thing to keep in mind, and we're going to see uh, why that is uh, in today's study as, as we go along. And with uh, any other videos that we do, probably we'll do one more, uh, and I think that should possibly two more, but at least one more for sure. In Romans 6.23, we see a cause and effect relationship between sin and the word for sin is Strong's number uh, 266 and death. Uh, death is Strong's number 2288. And both of these terms show up uh, together in about 11 other passages. And we want to look at nine of them today. Uh, I'd like to begin with Romans 5, 12, and 21 because they actually chronicle the, the devastating effects uh, that uh, resulted by Adam and Eve's sin in the garden, not only to them personally, but to the entire human race, and in fact, to this entire universe, which is why this, <clears throat> excuse me, this universe has to be destroyed, because it is tainted and corrupted by sin by that first sin, by the original sin of Adam and Eve. So let's look at Romans 5, 12 and 21. Uh, verse 12 of Romans 5, we read there, For wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Uh, verse 21, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. We can also go uh, to another passage. This is Romans 8.2. And in Romans 8.2, we find that this relationship between, between sin and death is actually called in the Bible a law. It's the law of sin and death. Romans 8, verse 2. 
For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And so here we see two laws that are in opposition uh, to each other. The law of sin and death and the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. If we go to uh, Romans 6.16... Uh, no, that's, yeah, here we go. Romans six sixteen. 16, uh, we find this statement here. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. And we see, among other things in this verse, that every man, woman, child, is a servant. The question is, who is that person serving? And there's only two possibilities, either the Lord Jesus Christ in obedience to the Bible or Satan. Uh, that's, that's it, basically. And you're either uh, a servant of Christ's and you have a desire to obey the word of God because God is working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure or you are a servant to sin and to Satan, and you are in his uh, dominion, and you will do, as we read, for example, in John 8, the lusts of your father, as Jesus told the Pharisees, ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Uh, Now, the next passage we want to look at is Romans 7, 5, and 13. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Then in... uh, Going down to verse 13 of Romans 7, we read, Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. We see this very clearly uh, uh, as uh, as God highlights this particular uh, idea in 1 Corinthians 15, 56. He takes it a step further than what we just read in Romans 7, 5, and 13. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 56, where it says, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. And we want to keep in mind that the law was never designed to save. It cannot, unless a person, and the only one that did this is the Lord Jesus Christ, could keep it perfectly. And he did. And he did it on behalf of all of his elect. Uh, But that is the only way that that law could be kept. The problem is, is that nobody can keep it. And so the law can only condemn. It can never give life. Uh, that's the point. It's, it's a condemnation. It's to reveal man's sinfulness. And it, it exposes man's sinfulness over and over and over again. In fact, the Bible tells us uh, that we are married to the law of God. And, and that law is pointing that accusing finger at us. And even though we, we don't want to admit it, we don't, we don't accept it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change that, that, the status, the marriage relationship between the unsaved person and the law of God. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a marriage that cannot be broken. 
you cannot, you, know, you cannot go and get a divorce from the law of God. It's not permissible. You are, are married. The only way out of that contractual relationship with the law of God is for God himself to marry you and, and uh, the, the child of God. That is the only way. That way the law becomes dead. And now you have a new husband. And the husband is the Lord Jesus Christ. And now there's a new relationship uh, that is based upon the work and faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, which was accomplished prior to the foundation of the world. When the Lord Jesus Christ made atonement for the sins of his elect people. He died, he was annihilated, and he rose again from the dead. And of course, this is all demonstrated in what happened uh, in 33 AD on the cross, the events leading up to the cross, that Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, he's in the earth, and then there's that resurrection early Sunday morning. Now, uh, let's also go to uh, James 1, 14 and 15. And in this passage, we see the progression of sin uh, in a person's life. Uh, James 1, 14 and 15, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And that this is the, the tragic consequence of what happened in the Garden of Eden. For a short period of time, Adam and Eve were living in close communion and fellowship and in, in joy with their Creator. And everything surrounding them was good. Uh, as God states uh, in, those, in that early, those early chapters of Genesis. And what happened with the fall, it's like someone threw a rock at the mirror and the mirror shattered. Previously, that mirror was reflecting the glory of God to Adam and Eve, and they in turn were reflecting back that glory. But now there was this, this uh, break uh, and there was a disconnect, and not only a disconnect, and not only did they w lose fellowship with God, but something far worse, as, as I stated uh, when, when I began today's lesson, and that is that not only did it eventually destroy Adam and Eve, particularly if, if they were not saved, and we don't know if they were or not. We know that their son Abel was, but we don't know about Adam and Eve for sure, but the, the consequences, like we read in Romans 5.12, passed on to every succeeding generation of human beings that would be born. They would not be born as Adam, uh, who was created in the image of God. They would have been born with sin nature. They would have been born with that corrupt nature that would then um, express itself as the, the child grows to be a toddler and then grows to be uh, uh, a, a, a little older and then eventually a teenager and then an adult in middle age and finally old age and then they die. That is the consequence. That is the progression because of what happened in the garden. And we can't point the finger at Adam and Eve because if it had been my wife and myself or you and your wife, if, if you're married, you would have done exactly the same thing because uh, Adam uh, was our, our head, so to speak. Uh, he was the representative of the entire human race. And, and this is the, the tragedy of the human race is sin. But wonderfully, as we re read in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God during the day of salvation, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord.
And that has always been the hope uh, up until our present day, which is a day like no other, the day of judgment, when there is, we don't have that hope. Uh, the only thing we can do is pray if we have loved ones that are not saved or family members that God, prior to May 21, 2011, did a work of grace in the hearts of individuals we love and know, and even those that we don't. Uh, and this, of course, brings up the, the, the whole matter of feeding sheep. This is why we are called at this particular time to feed sheep. This is the mandate that God has given to us. All right, let's look at one last verse. This is also in James, James 5.20. Uh, we read there, I'll start with verse 19. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Again, we see the wages of sin is death. Now, the passages I just quoted reveal the very close relationship between sin and death. And again, why do you think in these foregoing uh, verses that God would omit the concept of eternal suffering in these verses? Ponder that. A similar cause and effect relationship regarding sin and death is found in Galatians 6, 8. Here it has to do in Galatians 6, 8 with sowing and reaping with regard to the spirit and with regard to the flesh. Galatians 6, verse 8. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Again, we see this contrast. We see corruption, but it doesn't talk about eternal corruption. Just like in Romans 6.23, it doesn't talk about eternal death. It just says death. And here it just says corruption. And uh, I'm going to speak about that a little later, uh, but for right now, uh, just keep this word corruption in mind because it's a highly significant term. Uh, but before uh, looking at that, what I would like to do is to uh, again uh, consider the relationship between sin and death as expressed in the Old Testament. Uh, as I said, um, this is the origin for sin and death as we read in the book of Genesis. And in fact, why don't we go to Genesis 2, 16 and 17, and then 3, 19. Uh, Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And Jehovah God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, that was, uh, well, verse 15. Let's go to verse 16 and 17. And Jehovah God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, it's important to recognize that this was the first law that God gave. And this was a very important monumental test for Adam and Eve. And God clearly stated that if you disobey, then there's going to be death. That would be the consequence. Again, the wages of sin is death. We want to also keep in mind this was a spiritual judgment. In fact, the first of its kind, because Adam and Eve, as soon as they ate the fruit, did not fall over backwards and die. They lived for hundreds and hundreds of years later, but 
what did happen is they died spiritually. And if they were not saved, then eventually, uh, as God ushered, prior to God ushering in the new heavens and the new earth, they would be annihilated along with every other unsaved person because that is the, uh, the, the end result. That is the destruction that, we, that the Bible insists upon. Uh, that is the final end of man. Uh, he is remembered no more. Even, and even though that can never be changed, and so in that sense it's eternal, but it's destruction. And we're going to see this more and more, particularly in, in our study today. Um, this uh, phrase um, that we find uh, in, oh, I didn't read verse 19, Genesis 3, 19. Let me read that. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return. So again, we, we see where creation starts with God taking that lump of clay as it was and fashioning Adam and then breathing into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul. The end of that is that man returns to the dust. He simply dies and eventually he is annihilated. Now, the word dying, uh, or thou shalt surely die, and I've mentioned this before, it's worth repeating, and that is that we find two Hebrew words side by side. Uh, dying, thou shalt die. That's what it literally means in the Hebrew, thou shalt surely die. And God is making the point, we're talking about double death. Not, not just physical death, but complete annihilation. Um, we want to look at some passages that reveal uh, some of the ways in which God utilizes this term for death, which, by the way, here in the Old Testament is 4191. Because, again, it is highlighting this law of sin and death. And as we do so, we want to keep uh, Matthew 10, 28 in mind because it's a very key verse to understanding exactly what this death consists of. So let me read that, Matthew 10, 28. And fear not them which kill the body. This would be mankind can, can kill the body. But are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him, and this would be God, which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell, uh, which is the, uh, the word really for the grave. Uh, and we're going to spend quite a bit of time on that today, uh, later on in our study. Uh, but the idea here, of course, is that mankind can kill his fellow man, even though that goes contrary to the law of God. But they are not able to kill the soul. And we have to differentiate the soul of the child of God from the soul of the unsafe person or the non-elect. The non-elect soul dies within them the moment they die. The difference is for a child of God, his soul goes immediately to be absent from the body, is to be present with the Lord, immediately goes into heaven. His body, of course, goes into the grave, waiting for the resurrection on the last day. Now, uh, paralleling Romans 6.23, A, the wages of sin is death, uh, we can go to Ezekiel uh, 18.4. And in Ezekiel 18.4, uh, we find again another uh, principle. Uh, it's the same principle, it's said a little differently. 
uh, the, the law of sin and death. Uh, Ezekiel 18.4 Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Very straightforward, uh, making again the point that the wages of sin is death. Um, and you uh, might have noticed in this verse, in Ezekiel 18.4, there's a fourfold repetition of this Hebrew term soul, which is nephesh. It's Strong's number 5315. And again, you know, it's underscoring this law of sin and death. And we, um, if we go to uh, Genesis 42, uh, 38, we, we see where uh, this word death is used in connection with the grave or sheol, which is Strong's number 75, 85. Uh, death uh, or dead, as it is in this verse, is 41, 91. All right, Genesis 42, 38. And this has to do with uh, Jacob's reaction to his son's request uh, to uh, send Benjamin down with them into Egypt so they can buy uh, grain for their family because uh, unbeknownst uh, to, to them, Joseph had told them, unless you bring down your youngest uh, brother, um, you're not going to see my face. Uh, uh, Genesis 42, 38, and he said, this is Jacob speaking. My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, meaning Joseph, and he is left alone, because that's what Jacob and the others thought. If mischief, or that's what Jacob thought, the others knew that he had been sold to the Midianites and carried into Egypt. At last, I mean, that's when they last saw him. If mischief befall him by the way, in the which ye go, then shall ye bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. And here we, we see this word, for his brother is dead. 4191, and uh, then shall ye bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. This word bring down, we're going to see it a, a number of times today. It's Strong's number 3381, again pointing to the idea of going into the ground, going uh, into the grave. And of course, the grave is this word for hell. It's used 31 times as grave, another 31 times as um, hell, and then three times as the word uh, pit. Similarly, uh, Judah, Jacob's son, reiterates Jacob's words to Joseph regarding Benjamin in Genesis 44, 31. Uh, this is the next chapter over. <coughs> Pardon me. All right, let me read that. It shall come to pass when he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he will die. And thy servants shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant our father with sorrow to the grave. All right, so here again we see this word uh, is not with us, that he will die, uh, 4191. Again, we see this term shall bring down, uh, 3381, and to the grave, uh, Sheol, 75. 85. Now, besides Genesis 42, 38 and Genesis 44, 31, there is only one other verse in the entire Old Testament that contains these two Hebrew words, death, 4191, and the grave, 75, 85, together. 
And this is found in 1 Samuel 2, 6. So let's look at that. 1 Samuel 2, verse 6. <clears throat> Pardon me. The Lord, or Jehovah, killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. And, you know, some might look at this passage and say, well, you know, this matches exactly what we find in Daniel 12, 2. When God brings up or awakens the non-elect who have previously died. Let's look at that. Uh, Daniel 12, 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those individuals that believe that this is really speaking about the fact that the dead, the unsaved dead, are somehow going to be resurrected or come back to life somehow and then they're going to stand for judgment and then they're going to be consigned to the lake of fire for eternity but as i've attempted to show uh, throughout this series that idea is impossible and even today we're going to look at some verses that contradict that so whenever you come to a conclusion and yet there are verses in the Bible that contradict that conclusion. You have to go back to the drawing board, as it were, and re-examine that conclusion because there has to be harmony. Everything has to fit. Uh, you can't have a statement over here and then a contradictory statement over here and then pretend, oh, it doesn't matter. Yes, it does matter. Because God is not the author of confusion. Everything has to harmonize. And that is one of the reasons why Bible study is very difficult. Because it takes a lot of time to do that. And to put all the pieces together as God allows us to understand a particular doctrine. Or a particular verse or, or chapter. Whatever the case might be. We cannot trust ourselves we cannot trust our minds we have to look at the bible very objectively and ask the question what is god teaching here and lord help me because i don't know i don't understand it's way beyond me and even the simplest things are way beyond us as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my thoughts in my ways higher than your ways, as, as God declares in, in Isaiah 55. Now, with regard to this issue, uh, getting back to uh, 1 Samuel, uh, or getting back to Daniel 12 too, and I mentioned this in an earlier video, this word from, for contempt is actually the word abhorring uh, that we found in Isaiah 66, verse 4. Let's... Visit that. Isaiah 66, verse 4. No, I beg your pardon. It's, it's Isaiah 66, 24. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. And they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Or they shall be uh, in contempt of all flesh. And, you know, we started out by this whole series by looking at this verse uh, to begin with because it speaks about men that have died and they have transgressed God. He's the me here. Uh, 
And it goes on to say, their worm shall not die. And that worm and that word worm is the Hebrew word tola. It can refer either to mankind, it can refer to uh, Christ himself as well. And uh, the, the idea of, of, of not dying is the fact that it's not that they don't die. Of course they die. They die and then they're annihilated. But the, the language is such that the, um, the sentence is carried out throughout eternity. It's, it's like, you remember we, we spoke about, <clears throat> pardon me, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, which is a picture, it's a portrait of the vengeance of eternal fire. Uh, we read about that in Jude. Let's uh, look at that. And, and this is a very similar type um, or parallel concept. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, this is uh, Jude 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Is Sodom and Gomorrah still burning today? No. How long did it burn back then when, when God rained down fire and brimstone out of heaven? We don't know. A few days, a week, a couple weeks. But after that, it was it. It was gone. It stopped. The judgment of those that died continues. In other words, it can never be reversed. That sentence of death, the law of sin and death, cannot be reversed at all. It is set in stone. And, and this is the thing that, that we have to understand. Now, let's go on. Um, another way to, to look at that is that, that the shame and the contempt that these individuals, the non-elect who, who die, is that they remain perpetually under this sentence of God's wrath for eternity. It doesn't mean that they are somehow tortured forever in the lake of fire because that would require a, a, a soul that could endure or a body if they have a body to be able to endure that kind of punishment the the simple fact of the matter is that they die and they are annihilated they are destroyed it's as if they never ever existed and again, we, we have to keep uh, Matthew 10, 28 in mind. It bears repeating. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul of the elect. It doesn't say that I'm adding that. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And this word hell is the word Gehenna. Strong's number 1067 and it points to the grave and annihilation. Uh, we can also look at another Old Testament passage, uh, which is Ecclesiastes uh, 9.10. Ecclesiastes 9.10. Uh, we read there, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. In other words, mankind ceases from everything. That is the, the nature, the definition of death. You're no longer alive, and so there's nothing that you can do. You, you cannot think, you cannot feel, you, you, you cannot function at all because you are dead the body is incapable of doing anything, and it, and it succumbs to the, the natural processes of decay 
and eventually annihilation. Now, speaking of, of hell or the grave, which again, the, one of the main words in the Old Testament is Sheol, 7585. And as I mentioned, it's used 31 times as hell, 31 times as pit, excuse me, as grave, and three times as pit. Uh, and this is the case here in Ecclesiastes 9.10. It's uh, in the grave, Sheol, 75.85. But now might be a good time to take a closer look uh, at this particular word. We find, for example, if we go to Deuteronomy 32.22, A very profound statement here. For a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Here we see a number of very important terms. Uh, the term for fire which is Strong's number 784. And we know that God himself is a consuming fire. And fire can be indicative of God's wrath. It can also be used in a positive sense to purify or to cleanse. Uh, we see this very vividly today as God's people are being tested. They're being put through the fire, so to speak, and what comes forth is going to be, if they are an elect child of God, gold, silver, precious stones. The, the, the gold and the silver is liquefied by the fire and the dross, the impurities are burned away. And it's a process. It doesn't happen at the first pass. It, 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 it's a continual process that the believer goes through. And particularly today, as we are in this time of judgment, living in the day of judgment. And we also see God's anger because this is the nature of, the, of judgment day. God is pouring out his anger, his wrath upon the world. And, and, and the world is uh, become mad and everything is, is completely contrary to the word of God and it's it's divided. Satan's kingdom is being divided. And we see that in many places, wherever we might look today in society, various factor, various sections or sectors of society, we see this division taking place. And it's because Satan's kingdom has fallen and it's, being, uh, it's fighting against each other. And just like we saw in the Valley of Jehoshaphat where the, the, the various uh, 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 groups that were fighting against Israel ended up fighting against themselves and killing themselves. And this is the same idea. If Satan's kingdom, the Lord Jesus says, is divided, it cannot stand, but it has an end. And that is what we are seeing. Uh, the other word that is very significant is the word consume. Uh, Strong's number 398. Um, all right, let's then uh, look at some other passages. Uh, for example, we saw in Deuteronomy 32:22 uh, the two words for fire and consume. Fire is 784, consume is 398. Uh, these both appeared, uh, for example, in 1 Kings 18:38 that I quoted in an earlier uh, video indicating that God's anger, uh, which is portrayed as a consuming fire, obliterates everything in its path. There is nothing that is left. And, and this is a very dramatic portrait of that when Elijah uh, went to all the trouble of rebuilding the altar and uh, in obedience to God's command, he made this trench and they poured water, I believe, three times out of this barrel uh, so that uh, the, the bullock was completely saturated with water and, and it, and it, and it uh, ended up in this uh, uh, pool around the bullock uh, 
And what, what happened? We read in 1 uh, Kings 18.38 this, this amazing statement. Then the fire of Jehovah fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. What kind of fire is that that can do that? It, it is, you know, we, we have no idea uh, because this is a fire that consumes to the ultimate. And we have to keep in mind that this is the fire. This is the wrath of God upon those that do not have a Savior. Nothing is left. Everything is completely consumed, completely uh, annihilated. Uh, we also see this, uh, these two words, fire and consumed, in Judges 6.21 uh, with regard to the offering that God commanded Gideon to perform. Uh, Judges 6 21. We read there in Judges 6, 21. Then the angel of Jehovah put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of Jehovah departed out of his sight. So again, we see something similar there. Uh, also, uh, we find a parallel statement in 2 Chronicles 7.1, which has to do with the, uh, the completion of, the, of Solomon's uh, temple and the great ceremony, the dedication uh, of that temple, uh, we read there Second Chronicles seven one. Now, when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of Jehovah filled the house. Uh, verse two, and the priest could not enter into the house of Jehovah because the glory of Jehovah had filled. Jehovah's house. So again, uh, we see this um, uh, incredible power uh, that God has and that God demonstrates. Uh, it, it's just astounding to us. We can't even begin to comprehend the, the, the tiniest part of it. But we also see these two words, fire and consumed, uh, in 2 Kings 1, 10, and 12, as we see this account of these uh, three captains and their band uh, of 50 men each confront Elijah, and the first two do so, and they are instantaneously consumed. And of course, we see in this account uh, a, a spiritual relationship, one-third, which would be the last captain and his band of 50, and then the first two captains and their bands of 50. And they were consumed uh, because they uh, approached Elijah, who typifies the word of God, uh, very arrogantly uh, coming in the king's name, and immediately they were consumed. Fire came down from heaven, killed them all. Same thing happened with the second batch. Fire came down from heaven, killed them all. It was only the third captain who came fear with fear and trembling and fell on his knees and asked Elijah for mercy that was spared. And his 50 men were spared. He saw what had happened with the other two captains and their 50 men apiece. And so he approached very humbly, uh, very uh, in a contrite manner, again, typifying the, the reaction of those that are elect uh, to the word of God. 
we also, uh, if we go to Psalm 86, 13, uh, here we find a similar uh, affirmation that includes the same Hebrew word for soul that we saw in Ezekiel 18, 4, uh, nephesh. And that is, um, let's see, Strong's number 5315. Uh, this is a Psalm 86, 13. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. We see this uh, expression, the lowest hell. Two words, uh, from the lowest is 8482. Hell, of course, is Sheol, uh, 7585. And we're going to see this quite a, quite a number of times. But notice how the soul of the child of God is delivered from the lowest hell. It's delivered from the grave. And so it can only be one of God's elect. Uh, we, we also see uh, these terms slightly different in Psalm 88.6. Uh, it, here, it's a little different because of the fact that uh, this is being likened uh, to someone that is in the lowest pit or the lowest hell. Uh, I'll read it. Psalm 88, verse 6. Uh, let, me, let me just start with the first six verses, just so you get the context of, what's, of how this is being stated. O Jehovah God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. Let my prayer come before thee, incline thine ear unto my cry. For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draweth nigh unto the grave. I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that hath no strength free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more, and they are cut off from thy hand. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the deeps. I'll read verse 7. Thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. Here, it's presumably a child of God, but it's a child of God that is in some, you know, serious straits, uh, spiritually speaking. And, and he is reckoning or, or uh, counting himself as one. He, he is so distraught for whatever reason, all right, that, that he is likening himself to one that goes down into the grave, one that goes down into the pit, uh, the, in, into a situation of utter hopelessness. But yet, we know that regardless of the situation that a child of God may, may face, and there are many, particularly in our day, that are facing tremendous trials and tremendous challenges. And, you know, I, I think oftentimes of David at one point they had the the bands had come in and had taken his wives and the wives of his men and their children and taken them away captive and they were so distraught that David says you know they're about ready to kill me they're about ready to stone me and yet and I forget exactly where the passage is but David says David encouraged himself in the Lord. That was the solution. Things all around him looked like they were falling apart. People were about ready to kill him, stone him, and yet David encouraged himself in the Lord. There is that refuge. There is that hiding place under the shadow of his wings that the child of God can run to. We run into that high tower. We, we run into that fortress. Uh, 
we run to the into the shadow under the shadow of his wings because there is solace there is comfort there is hope there is love because we know <clears throat> that God is in control of whatever situation we may be in that we may be facing no matter how difficult it may appear we can understand that God is in charge that God knows all about it and that God somehow is using that that very trial that that very difficult situation that, that in fact it appears impossible from our point of view but yet God is using that to build up the child of God to to uh, work in their lives to bring blessing and and those are the times when the child of God really grows it's not when everything is going well it's just the opposite everything seems to be falling apart there seems to be no rhyme or reason to anything and we just wonder what's going on and yet God wants us to trust him just like Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. This is the attitude that the child of God uh, needs to have. Um, in Psalm 88, 6, you might have noticed a couple terms. I'll read it again. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit. This word pit is not uh, 75, 85, Sheol, it's bore, 953. In darkness, in the deeps, uh, these, I want to take a, a closer look at these two terms, in darkness and in the deeps. Darkness is 4285, and in the deeps is 4688, excuse me. Uh, in Psalm 88.6, we discovered uh, the same word for lowest as in Psalm 86.13. But <clears throat> we find this parallel term pit as well, which is found in a number of other uh, passages. <clears throat> Excuse me. For example, let's go to Lamentations 3.55. Lamentations 355 we read there they have cut off my life in the dungeon and cast a stone upon me uh, here we see that Jeremiah is spiritually picturing the Lord Jesus under the wrath of God as Jeremiah was consigned to a dungeon and in reality, this was a pit, a pit of mire. And, um, and, and again, here, the, the low, this is the same word, low or lowest, 84, 82, and dungeon is this word, pit or bore, uh, 953. Also, we can go to Ezekiel. 2620 uh, Ezekiel 2620 and here we we read when I shall bring thee down with them that descend into the pit with the people of old time and shall set thee in the low parts of the earth in places desolate of old with them that go down to the pit that thou be not inhabited, and I shall set glory in the land of the living. It looks like we're going to have to stop here today because we've run out of time. Uh, hopefully you can join us uh, next week when we do part seven. Thanks again. Oh.